And then I started making sort of new connections. There were other challenges to this materialistic worldview that appeared, things like David Bohm's holographic model of the universe or Carl Pribram's holographic model of the brain, Rupert Sheldrake's idea of the morphogenetic fields, Ilya Prigozhin and his dissipative structures. And I realized that there is a new scientific worldview emerging. And what was very exciting is that every piece of this new evidence that was coming was embarrassing and challenging for the old materialistic worldview, but was always very enthusiastically embraced by transpersonal psychology. So I really generated a hope that transpersonal psychology one day will be an integral part of a new worldview. There will be a kind of a marriage of this new paradigm in science and transpersonal psychology. So this much about the biographical introduction, sort of explaining where I'm coming from and how it can happen that somebody with all the traditional credentials can somehow end up in the camp of mysticism and feels the need for a psychology that is in great conflict with everything that we believe to be real in psychology and psychiatry and traditional Western science. Now, after this general introduction, we'll come to the main topic of the series, which is the transpersonal vision, and we will explore the implications of this research for various areas of human life. We'll start by talking about non-ordinary states in general, because that's the major source of information that I would be building on as I'm talking about these different subjects. When I say non-ordinary states of consciousness, what I mean is states that are significantly different from our everyday state of consciousness. We'll talk about them quite a bit later, but at this point I would like to say that those are states, for example, that we can experience in various shamanic procedures, in trance states, in spiritual practice during some kind of deep meditation, states that we can experience under hypnosis, states that we can experience in psychedelic sessions, and also states that some people can experience for unknown reasons in the middle of their everyday life. It's very important that we talk at some length about non-ordinary states because the Western industrial culture is really not very familiar with these states, which is quite different from the native cultures that all held these states in very high esteem and spent a lot of time developing techniques of inducing them, and they were using them as an integral part of their ritual spiritual practice, of their healing practices. They were using them for exploration of extrasensory perception, exploration of intuition. They were using them as a source of artistic inspiration and so on. Whereas the Western industrial civilization has pathologized these states. Now, from this general introduction, we'll talk about some of the practical implications. For example, that the work with the non-ordinary states of consciousness gives us completely new understanding of what it is to have emotional and psychosomatic disorders, and also how our strategy in therapy of these disorders or in some kind of systematic self-exploration would be very different if we take into consideration these experiences and observations. So we'll explore something about the new insights into the emotional and psychosomatic disorders and also the implications of these new insights for psychotherapy. We'll dedicate a special session to the experience of death and dying, which obviously is an extremely relevant topic. I mean, we can't imagine a topic that would be more relevant for each of us, because as we go through life, each of us will lose relatives and friends and teachers, and then ultimately, sooner or later, we'll be facing the situation of dying ourselves. We will also explore the broadest philosophical, spiritual, metaphysical insights from non-ordinary states. And we'll see that they first of all show us that spirituality is a legitimate dimension in the human psyche and in the universal scheme of things. And it will provide for us this sort of uh, large, comprehensive, all-encompassing 
vision of reality which would be very different from the one presented by materialistic science and shared by the Western industrial civilization, yet a vision which seems to be perfectly compatible with Huxley's perennial philosophy on the one hand and with the emerging paradigm in science on the other. And finally, in the last session, we'll explore the practical implications. You know, what does all this new knowledge mean in our life individually and also collectively? How can we make our life more fulfilling, more rewarding, more creative? And also, what can we learn that would help us to alleviate the global crisis that we are all facing and avert the kind of a destructive and self-destructive trends that we all see the Western civilization is taking. So this is the general outline of the series and the different areas we'll explore and what we would like to accomplish here. Before I start talking more specifically about non-ordinary states of consciousness, I would like to explain in which sense I will be using that term. That term non-ordinary states of consciousness is very broad. There are many conditions that can change our consciousness, including various forms of pathology. So we can have, for example, a brain tumor and have our consciousness change. We can have an infectious disease of the whole body, like typhoid fever and have our consciousness change. We can have encephalitis, meningitis, we can have severe arteriosclerosis or some degenerative processes in the brain, or we can get very drunk and have a non-ordinary state of consciousness. So it's a very broad category, and I'm not interested here in this context in all non-ordinary states of consciousness, but in a very special subcategory. What we're interested in is non-ordinary states of consciousness from which we can gain some profound knowledge about the human psyche and possibly the nature of reality, and also non-ordinary states of consciousness which are interesting from the point of view of therapy, personal transformation, and consciousness evolution, states from which we can benefit in some significant ways. Now, there is such a significant subgroup of these states but we do not have a term for it in current psychiatry, and this is why I coined such a term myself. I call them holotropic states. It's a composite word where holos in Greek means whole, and tropic is derived from trepein, which means to move towards something or be oriented towards something. So it literally means oriented towards wholeness or moving towards wholeness, states that move us towards wholeness. You might know that term tropic or tropism from the term heliotropic, where it is the property of the plant to always follow the sun. When we put a plant, we take it from darkness and put it on a windowsill, it will be orienting itself towards the sun. Helios is sun, trapein again is moving towards. So holotropic states are states which help us somehow to move towards a state of wholeness, which would imply that in our everyday state of consciousness we are not whole, we are kind of fragmented, we are operating just from a partial aspect of ourselves. So these holotropic states, they differ significantly from the rest of non-ordinary states, which can be described maybe as trivial deliria or organic psychosis. In these organic psychosis, People are disoriented. They might not know who they are, where they are, what's happening, what year it is. Their intellect is impaired. Memory is impaired. They might have amnesia for these states. None of this is true for the states that I call holotropic. Here, consciousness is changed very profoundly, but also in a very subtle way. People never lose the orientation. They know who they are, where they are, what's happening. But at the same time, another reality starts also invading their conscious awareness. So in a sense, they have each foot in a different world, being in two realities at the same time. Now, these holotropic states are characterized by perceptual changes in all sensory 
areas. We can have visions, we can hear things, we can have sensations that don't have any basis in consensus reality. We can experience taste and smells and so on. We experience very intense and often unusual emotions. And these emotions can cover a very broad range from states of ecstatic rapture, and of heavenly bliss, feelings of cosmic unity and so on. And on the other side of the spectrum, there could be experiences of abysmal despair, of terror, of consuming guilt and so on, very infernal states. So it covers a broad range from sort of heavenly to infernal states and anything in between.